Hi everybody and welcome to our very last lecture for marine biology. Um, thank you so much for having an amazing semester with me. Um, I really appreciate everything um, and we had so much fun. Thank you, thank you, thank you again. Um, I hate to leave things on a sour note or on a sad note, um, but our last lecture is on human impacts uh, and the environment. And we've already kind of alluded to this fact throughout the semester, but I'm sure you guys have come to realize that human impacts are not always a good thing. In fact, most of the time they're really, really a bad thing. Um, so it is going to be a little bit depressing, but we do end on a positive note, so don't worry. We're all going to be okay, um, hopefully. <laughs> Uh, but you guys are the future generation, so you know. Remember, this is up to you to actually make a difference when it comes to some of this stuff. So I hope that I've, you know, shown you guys a lot of information and made you care about some of these marine organisms. And uh, hopefully, you keep that with you in the future. Anyways, um, let's get on to our talk about human impacts um, for our very, very last lecture for marine biology. All right, so we're going to be talking about the different types of ways that humans can actually impact the environment, specifically the marine environment. Um, and they're not usually good. Like I said, they're, they're not always a good thing. Um, so we have things like over-harvesting, and we're going to go through each one of these. But humans have gotten really good at harvesting, and therefore we're just taking so much from the ocean. And usually people think, oh, well, the ocean's really big. You know, must have tons of resources out there. But like we've learned about before, Remember, it's not uniform. You don't get the same species far away from the shore that you do near shore. So the community compositions are not uniform throughout the entire ocean, and therefore overharvesting close to the shores can, can actually, overharvesting anywhere can be a big, big problem. Um, invasion. So you think like alien invasions, um, kind of. It's called invasive species, and this is where species come into or introduce into an environment that they're not normally found in. So things like natural predators, they actually, they wouldn't have because they didn't evolve with that ecosystem. They weren't around for long periods of time for complex food webs to develop and, you know, predators to start eating them. So a lot of times these um, invasive species come in and they actually get established really well. And because they don't really have any natural predators because they're not normally found in this area, um, sometimes they do better than the normal species that are there and can outcompete the normal species that are there driving them away. So, yeah, again, bad things. Pollution, that should not shock you guys. We are polluting the, the hell out of our planet, I will say it. Um, and it's not something to even joke about because, I mean, we have things like the Great Pacific Garbage Patch which is just a huge floating island of garbage like the size of Texas in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And it's caught in one of these gyres and so it's just spinning and spinning and spinning and spinning and not really going anywhere. So we're trying to figure out ways that we can actually reduce our pollution that's actually in the ocean already as well as decreasing the amount of pollution that eventually finds its way to the ocean. Um, physical alteration, like I said, we've already talked about this when it comes to rivers and streams and beach and coastal areas. People like to live near water and therefore they kind of tend to build up on those places and sometimes there are estuaries and nursery grounds and we lose those because people want to live near the water and so, you know, just any kind of, um, any kind of construction that we're doing, any kind of building that we're doing, even any kind of modification that we're doing, if, even if you're building channels and stuff like that, that alters the natural ecosystem and therefore can really affect some of these species, um, and sometimes in a really drastic way. And then finally, climate change. Um, we don't call it global warming anymore, despite the fact that the Earth is on average getting warmer. Uh, we do call it climate change, and that's because all climates are changing. You know, droughts are getting longer and more severe. Floods are getting more severe. Um, storms and hurricanes are getting stronger uh, and more frequent because of this climate change. And we have things like, you know, the coral bleaching and, and things that we've already kind of talked about. But that's all due to this climate change. And most of it's due to pollution, like CO2 pollution in our atmosphere. So, again, I told you, I warned you guys this wasn't going to be the happiest of the lectures. But it is something that we really do need to talk about. And... We, now that we've learned about all the marine organisms and we've learned about all the ecosystems that they live in, it's now time to learn about how we're affecting those ecosystems um, every day. All right, so over-harvesting. Like I said before, uh, humans have gotten really good at things like fishing, right? Our boats have gotten better. Our technology has gotten better. There's more of us out there doing it. So it wasn't just back in the day when, you know, a handful of fishermen went out on a kayak and with a, a ham net actually pulled in the take for the day, you know, that's sustainable. That's, you know, we're not taking a lot. We're not taking an abundance of, and we're certainly only taking what we want. 
um, and not taking all these what's called bycatch, which is just all sorts of things that you didn't intend to catch but can get caught in your nets. Um, so we, you know, used to be a handful of people going out, the fishermen who would feed the village. Now we have these huge nets and this technology to make things expedited and even faster and even more efficient, which is great for industry, but bad for the environment. So now we're taking a huge amount that we're not necessarily using. Seafood is one of the biggest wastes on this planet is because it goes bad really quickly and it doesn't have a long shelf life. So between the time you've caught it, the time you froze it, the time you've sent it to market and the time you buy it, sometimes, again, a lot of that food actually goes to waste. So all of those organisms have died and, and are not in the, in the environment to replenish the population because they've been taken and technically they died for nothing. Um, this is something that I have a big problem with because people are always asking like, well, do you fish? And yes, I do fish, but I go out and I catch one, maybe two legal sized fish and then I'm done for the day because that's what I'm going to eat that night or at least in the next couple days. I'm not going to bother throwing it in the freezer. If I want frozen fish, I'll just go buy frozen fish. Um, you know, I, I try to use it, it when it's fresh and when it's, you know, at its peak. And if I don't, you know, if I don't think I'm going to eat it, I don't take any more fish. Right. So many people that I know go for the limit and they get what's called the catch limit. And so say maybe for one species, it's 12 fish. So now you have 12 fish at home. Right. Maybe you eat three or four of those fish, but then your bodies hit you up and go, let's go fishing again. And you're like, well, I still have eight fish in the freezer that I'm not going to. Hmm, OK, let me chuck those so I can have new fish. So those fish died and you're going to go kill new fish without. Ah, so it's this it's this really terrible cycle that we've gotten into sometimes about waste. Um, grocery stores too, if it goes past a certain expiration date, they have to throw it away. So they're throwing away thousands of pounds of, of good food that could have been either used in the ocean or left to reproduce, but we're not even end up using it. But it's really, it's, it's actually pretty sad. Um, so there's things like sustainable fisheries that you can actually go through. Um, and if it means sustainable, it was probably caught like a single rod and reel kind of what's called hook and line instead of these really really big trawl nets these huge nets are just pulling in everything and anything it doesn't matter how big you are it doesn't matter how small you are there's no size limits um now i do have to say that commercial fishing is quite heavily regulated by our government however recreational fishing is not so heavily rec um regulated so when i talked about those catch limits those bag limits yeah they have bag limits, but say you're a charter boat and you're taking all these people out to go recreational fishing. Say you have 60 people on your boat. 60 people on your boat who can each get 12 fish. That's a lot of fish. And then those people are going to go out the next day and the next day and the next day and the next day and the next day. So a lot of the time, these recreational fishing um, companies are actually kind of part of the problem. So you usually think, oh, it's the commercial fishing industry. It's a commercial. It's not always. In fact, the recreational fishing industry has... has kind of over like surpass the commercial fishing in terms of taking too many fish. So of course, commercial, um, recreational fishing companies are going to be like, well, we have to survive. We have to feed our children. This is always the argument of fishermen. We have to feed our children. And it's like, okay, well, yeah, you have to feed your children now, but what about your kids, 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 right? There's going to be nothing left in the ocean for them. Have you thought about that? So that's always the scientist's argument is, well, yeah, you have, to, you have to have some kind of regulations now, otherwise there's not going to be any fish later on. So you might be able to survive and feed your kids, but your kids' kids won't, right? Your grandkids won't be able to feed themselves if, they, if they're fishermen because all the fish will be gone. So I know, I'm sorry, terribly depressing, but ah, we, got, we have to end on one, uh, you know, we have to talk about that. So again... We used to be kind of bad at fishing and there wasn't a lot of us out there doing it and the technology wasn't super great. So we only got what we needed, right? Now the technology is amazing and we're just pulling in so many fish, a lot of them that are actually going to waste. And I'm not talking just fish. There's a lot of other things that get caught as bycatch in these nets and that they die unnecessarily. But we're going to talk about that one, you know, just a little bit. So this isn't just across like one fishery, like um, it's not like say the cod fishery, which did absolutely collapse in the early 1900s and has not ever recovered. So cod used to be a huge fishery. I think it wasn't even the 1900s. I think it was like the 1980s. Um, yeah, cod used to be a huge fish. Everything used to be cod. All that breaded fish that you got and the fish fillets and the fish sticks that all used to be cod. Then we overfished all the cod. All the cod are gone. 
and they haven't been able to recover yet. So we switch to another species of fish. Then we switch to another species of fish and then another species of fish. And as you can see right here, they're all hurting. Every single one of them is showing the same trend, which is their populations start out high and then phew, quickly drop. Right. So and that's because we're just over harvesting. We're not giving them the time to replenish their populations. We're not giving them the time to reproduce or we're just taking too many just all the time. Um, so even if they are reproducing, we're just still taking them and we're just taking them over and over and over again. Uh, fun fact, which is not so fun. Lobster used to be prison food because it's a bottom dwelling kind of detritus eating nasty organism that lives in the muck. And you're like, wait a minute, people will be like, um, we don't eat that. That's for prisoners. Like, that's like, that's below us. Now, lobster is a delicacy because we've overfished all the other things and what else is left? So again, overfishing is a huge, huge problem worldwide in all the fisheries. We're not even just talking fish. You know, a fishery could be shrimp, lobster, crab. Those are all considered still fisheries. Um, and they're all hurting. Every single one of them is hurting right now. And that's just because of what we're doing and, and how much we're taking without necessarily needing all of it. Like, you don't need all of that. But again, greed. Greed. Literally, just take as much as you can. We might be able to sell it. We might not. Whatever. We'll go back and get more tomorrow. I know. Not good. All right. So, some of the effects of actual overfishing are um, things like reduced numbers. Obviously, just straight up population decline. Uh, but you also usually have a, a, a younger average age. So normally you have the younger and the middle age and the older individuals in a population. Well, when you take all the larger ones, that's all the older ones. Okay, so then now you're left with just a younger population. This can kind of be a problem because if those younger juveniles aren't sexually mature yet, they're not going to be able to reproduce. So now the only thing you have in your population are sexually unmature organisms that can't even replenish said population. It's only the middle age to the adults that can actually reproduce. So now you have a population of young individuals that aren't going to be able to reproduce or not reproduce as much. Um, you also have decreased sex ratios. So sometimes the male species is slightly larger, like when we learned about the California sheep hen. Those are larger fish, and therefore people want to take them more, so they're targeted more. So now you're removing the males out of the population, and now you have a skewed sex ratio. So now there's a bunch of females, but not enough males to actually reproduce. So again, your genetics is going to kind of get messed up because you're all getting, your population essentially is all from these handful of males instead of a big group of males that we would normally have because the males are being targeted. Um, uh, yeah, decreased reproductive, uh, what's called fecundity or the amount that you re reproduce. So when you decrease fecundity because you have a population of small individuals who can't reproduce because they're not sexually mature yet, then you're just going to decrease all of your uh, reproductive success. So you're essentially, you're not going to have what's called recruitment the next year. You're not going to have a big population the next year because of new individuals because you didn't have anybody reproducing. So you can't have new individuals if nobody's reproducing. So that decreases your what's called fecundity or the amount of offspring that you can have. Um, so community changes too, ecosystem changes. Remember we learned about the kelp forest, we learned about what happens when you remove the sea otters, right? The urchin population goes crazy, the kelp goes down, uh, everything else goes down, right? That shifts in the community composition, that shifts in the ecosystem. So when you're say overfishing those uh, sea otters, you know, that could still be considered fishing, hunting, I guess. Um, but that has shifted the community composition. Now you remove all the sharks from a population, that community is going to shift it's going to shift the direction of the community, which could cause all sorts of changes in the trophic food webs. Um, and again, your community composition, because some of those could be key important players in your ecosystem. And when you remove them, especially in high numbers, it really shifts the population in the community. And that can be totally bad and detrimental. Ah, so that's overfishing, right? We take too much. We don't always use it. And we don't let the population have a chance to recover. Right. So well, there's, we're going to talk about things that we can do to fix all these problems, but let's continue on with the problems right now. And let's talk about invasive species. So invasive species, again, are species that are not normal, not native to that area. So a normal air animal that living that would live in that area is called a native species. It is native there because it lives there naturally. Um, an invasive species is something that comes in and invades their territory. Now, usually organisms are not able to do this, right? There's barriers, geographic barriers, distance barriers, just physical barriers that aren't going to allow organisms to call, uh, colonize that new area. Um, however, thanks to us, we're the worst, 
uh, we kind of in help invasive species, you know, invade. So back in the day when ships were coming over from England, they had stowaways, and those stowaways were little rats. And that's how North America got rats. I'm not kidding. Like, that's literally how there are rats in this country, is because ships used to come over from England. There were rats in England. They would crawl onto the ships. They would hide on the ships. And then when they would dock, the ships would dock, those rats would crawl off and then go reproduce. Which is why the East Coast, like New York and those areas, have such high rat populations. Yeah, because that's where all the ships landed. And that's where all the ships got off, or the rats got off. Um, horses. Horses are not native to uh, North America. We brought them over. And now they're still, there's still a whole uh, herds of wild horses out there, like especially in Nevada and stuff like that. You can still go see them. It's actually pretty cool. Um, a lot of the times these invasive species come over in ballast water. Now, when you have a boat, it tends to rock back and forth. So what they do is they fill up the very bottom of the boat with what's called ballast water. This kind of helps to stabilize the boat from rocking back and forth and making everybody seasick. So that ballast water that is going to, again, help the boat from rocking back and forth, it's gonna stabilize that boat right there. That ballast water gets picked up in the harbor. So when the boat, before the boat leaves, they fill the ballast, right? Now the ship is nice and stable, now they can sail. Well, when they get to the new harbor, they dump said ballast water. Well, the dumping of that ballast water actually releases these tiny larvae. So imagine that in your harbor, you have larvae of some barnacle. Right? So now you have a population of these little barnacles that gets transported to a new area. Those barnacles are going to eventually settle out in the new harbor and start growing and possibly reproducing. Well, maybe those barnacles don't have any natural predators because nobody's ever seen that barnacle before. Right? It's a whole different species of barnacles that nobody in America has seen before. They're all from England. And so their predators are like, well, I don't even know what that is or how to eat it. I'm just going to keep eating my normal species that I normally eat here. So this new invasive species gets no predators and now is reproducing like crazy and just keeps reproducing and just keeps reproducing and reproducing. And now maybe they outcompete. Maybe they grow faster than the regular barnacles. Maybe they grow taller than the re regular barnacles and prevent the regular barnacles from being able to get any food. Right? So whatever. Maybe they outcompete the barnacle in some way. So now... Right, that new barnacle is going to grow and reproduce with no predators and it's out competing the new species and boom, the community composition shifts between these regular barnacles and the new invasive species barnacles. So now there's more of those barnacles and we don't know what kind of ecological repercussions they could have. Maybe they could wipe out all barnacles in our, you know, in the United States. Maybe we have no more gooseneck barnacles because this new invasive species came over. So this kind of, it really can do these really detrimental things um, because it's not normally there. Normally, as a species and an ecosystem, they kind of all evolve together, right? As one maybe becomes more abundant, maybe the predator of that one becomes more abundant as well because there's more resources for everybody. Um, so there's all these shifts in the community composition that can happen um, when you mess with the populations that are there. So, like I said, this is something that we pretty much, we are responsible for. That species would never be able to get from London to New York if it wasn't for us and our ballast water. So... Not really a common problem in the wild, you know, when we're not involved. But, um, again, all sorts of these different things, you know, these, these reasonings right here are, are ways that we can introduce these invasive species. Um, I think bunnies in Australia was a classic example as well. Some farmer brought a bunch of bunnies to Australia and then we're like, man, they're reproducing like crazy. I really can't have this anymore. So they just let them go. And now no joke, bunnies, rabbits are just taken over Australia to the point where it's a huge problem. So then humans were like, okay, there was a bunch of scientists out there who were like, we got this. Let's kill the bunnies. Let's introduce snakes. Snakes eat bunnies. Let's introduce the snakes. So then they introduced a bunch of snakes to Australia. And the snakes were like, yeah, I'm not going to eat those bunnies. I'm going to go eat something else. So that didn't work. So now there's a bunch of snakes and bunnies. So they're like, okay, dingoes. Dingoes will eat the bunnies. No, nope, no. Nope. They introduced more dingoes and the dingoes ate something else. Or maybe a couple bunnies, but... Still, bunnies are out of control. So there's some times that we actually introduce something into the wild and then we try to fix it. And we make things worse by trying to fix it. Yeah, like I said, guys, we're just terrible at this. We're getting better, but we're just terrible. Because again, we don't realize the ecological repercussions of, say, introducing a handful of bunnies into a population. This is now why um, countries have these regulations like, don't bring any fruit. Don't bring any animals. If you're coming into our country, don't bring anything that might affect our local ecosystem because we've been doing it for so long and we're just bad at it. All right. 
Now, most of these, if you do introduce a new species into an ecosystem, most of the time they don't survive. There's not enough of them to populate and kind of take over, or they just are not used to the ecosystem and get eaten, just get picked off. So most of the time it's not really a problem, but sometimes it can be a very serious problem. Um, so again, they can outcompete the native species. They can, um, you know, increase predation on native species. Um, all sorts of, of sorts of terrible things that we just talked about that um, invasive species are so good at doing and really bad. All right, let's move on to the next topic. Let's talk about some pollution, right? This is kind of a big one. We have things like plastic pollution, chemical pollution, noise pollution. So with everybody locked inside right now for whole coronavirus, um, the, the whales are back and they're singing more and they're coming closer to land because there's not all this boat traffic going back and forth that they're like, oh my God, I can't even stand all this noise. Birds are coming back. Um, wildlife is, is exploring again because all the humans are inside. They're like, oh, it's safe to come out now. It's safe to come out. So noise pollution can even be a thing. Um, CO2, inc the increase of CO2 is not, hopefully not shocking to anybody, but it is super detrimental to our environment. It causes things like ocean acidification, holes in our ozone layer. Um, essentially, we're just choking on ourselves and we're cutting down all the things that take up CO2, like trees and, and things like that. So all sorts of bad is going on with pollution. Um, so toxins is a, is a big one. You know, you can't talk about pollution without talking about toxins. There's things like PCBs and DDTs and stuff that are really, really nasty that last for so many years after you even stop polluting them. So San Francisco Bay is a classic example um, of these areas where they used to have all this industry, they used to have all this chemical waste, and they would just dump it in the bay. And be like, oh, just dump it in the bay. Not a problem for us. Well, it literally gets into the sediments and it stays in the sediments for years. So they haven't been doing this for 50 years. Pollution's still there. Still absolutely there. The PCBs and DDT levels are still there and they're still high. In fact, they're so high that there's sometimes that the Bay Area will actually issue warnings that say you can't swim. Don't go in the Bay because all of these levels are, you know, they're being stirred up and now they're back in the water. And it's just these chemicals and these toxins are really, really nasty. And sometimes they last for a very, very long time in our environment. So pollution in the ocean used to be a really big thing and a really big problem. Um, we've definitely getting, we're getting better with it, but it's still not perfect. It's, by no means is it perfect. Um, we talked about carbon, nitrogen is also bad. Like all of these, these, you know, chemicals in excess can be bad. Again, the ocean is very, very balanced and usually quite stable. When we start polluting it, we start throwing it out of balance. And then that's going to affect everyone's physiology in the ocean and can do some really, really bad things. Um, with the increased uh, CO2 in the air, it actually gets absorbed into the ocean. We already talked about this. It gets turned into carbonic acid. That acid not only causes things like ocean acidification, which causes the corals to bleach, but it causes like the structure of shells to deteriorate. So any shelled organism, exoskeleton, an actual shell, all of that material is based from nutrients and minerals and stuff that are in the ocean to, to give them their strength. As soon as you start messing with the chemistry of that ocean, you're putting them in acid essentially, you're gonna be breaking down those shells. So now that organism that uses a shell for protection has a weak shell and now is gonna get eaten by the predator. So the whole point of having that shell, the whole point of evolving that shell for millions of years is now out the door because your shells are weak now because of the chemicals that we've put into the ocean. So, I, yeah, you know, should not shock you guys. This is a, this is a sad, sad topic, this pollution. Uh, not just that, but we're constantly doing it. It's not even just everyday pollution. Sometimes there are big disasters and pollutions, like when oil rigs blow up and all of this oil now gets just dumped into the ocean. This nasty oil, which is really hard to separate from water, you know, gets dumped by millions of gallons into the ocean. There's nothing we can do about it because it's our, we just don't have the technology for that yet. Um, and it causes horrific, horrific things for these animals. Um, these animals don't have hands. They don't have soap. They can't wash themselves off. And this oil can stick to them and sometimes permanently. It can coat their gills. It can coat their lungs. It can coat their feathers to the point they can't swim. They can't move. Um, it can just, it just, it's, it's sad. It's really, it's devastating. Um, devastatingly sad when the, when these things happen. So again, this pollution guys, big, big problem. All right, moving on to our next big, big problem, habitat alteration. 
Um, this is when we're, again, humans are coming in and we're modifying these areas for our benefit, but most of the time for nobody's benefit but ours, just ours. So everybody else kind of gets affected and always negatively in these areas. The, the birds and the barnacles and the fish aren't going, oh, thank God we have new condos. You know, it's only benefiting the humans and it's hurting ev absolutely everything else. So when you want to live near the water, maybe you just killed an estuary and you killed a nursery area for that endangered species that only happens to live in that one estuary. Yeah, that whole species is gone because you wanted to live near the water and have a nice view. Which, I mean, I understand. I get. I want to live near the water. But it does, we have to take these things into consideration, especially as we move forward. You know, we can't change what we did in the past, but we can change what we do in the future. So it is, it is important to kind of understand the ecology of these areas before we actually start developing on them. Is this a completely endangered species, only nursery habitat, or is it just another area that we could utilize? Um, so again, all these things have to kind of be taken into consideration before we can do all this building. Um, more building. So, you know, there's, there's things like dredging that we do, which basically just means like digging up the bottom. We do this to make canals and stuff to live on, right? We've just tore up whatever was on the bottom. Any of those benthic species are affected. Any of the reefs that were there affected. Um, you know, we build these waterways, we build these, um, harbors, we build all sorts of different stuff right on, right on the beach, right on the shore. And it, it can absolutely affect some of these organisms. Wastewater treatment plants, we release a lot of that waste and that water back into the ocean. And there's sometimes like right at those dump sites, you know, you have a bunch of toxins and chemicals and stuff like that. Um, the wastewater itself gets warmed up. So now all of a sudden in the cold ocean, you have this like random warm spot. Um, you know, down in Huntington Beach, it's a very populated area uh, for sea turtles because they have a wastewater treatment plant right there would actually releases out um, hot water and so these sea turtles actually come to enjoy that hot water um, that's unnatural I mean yeah sea turtles are getting a kick out of it right now but what else is it affecting so you have warm water there but what cold water species could possibly you be driving away or killing because you're releasing all this warm water um, kind of stuff like that so it's not just development either um, sometimes individually we can actually go out there and ruin things like boaters so boat damage is actually a big one too, especially in say like the Florida Keys where it's a lot of shallow water areas. They have those big eelgrass beds, those seagrass beds, and sometimes they're living in this much water. And if you don't know where you're going and you happen to hit a sand, a, so um, a shallow area, your propeller rips up long lines of that eelgrass, that seagrass bed. So when you did have a nice, thick, dense community, now you have all these lines cut into it, you know, which is going to affect it in ways we can't even understand yet. Um, so again, these propellers, which you can see right here, actually leave all these lines. And this is a super common sight in Florida. Like everywhere we go, where it kind of gets a little shallow, you see this. Boaters who don't necessarily know where they're going and they rip through these shallow water areas. And not just the shallow water areas, they rip through lots of things, um, including manatees. You know, these lines and these scars right here, you can see on almost every single manatee I've ever seen in my life has those scars on them. Because they're a slow-moving animal, and so, boom, that boat rips right over them, and just, they can't go anywhere. They get tore up along their back, and it doesn't kill them, but it's, like, essentially, like, slashing them or whipping them or scarring them for life. So, yeah, boating is a big one. Uh, dynamite fishing. Did you know dynamite fishing was a thing? Yeah, in some countries, it's a really, really big thing. So, they just go out, and then they just throw dynamite in the water, pff, kill whatever's there, it floats up to the surface, they just collect them. But they're killing these reefs while they do it. These reefs that spent millions, thousands and millions and, you know, hundreds of years trying to grow and develop and create these 3D structures that in an instant, in a, in literally an instant, in a boom, right, they're now gone and they're gone forever. Um, so dynamite fishing, I just, I don't even understand that. Get a fishing pole. Um... And again, things like this, like beautiful estuaries and waterways that we used to naturally have are really easy to turn into things like harbor because they're already naturally dug out. So that's commonly what we do. But again, those estuaries and those harbor areas, those little nursery areas were, are super crucial for a lot of species. And then we turn them into this, which makes it beneficial for only one species, us. Um, so we really do unfairly take over the ocean uh, and the coast and, and everything. And we just abuse it in just terrible ways. All right, getting to uh, climate change, right? Global climate change. This is not a shock to anybody, well, at least 
Actually, you know what? I shouldn't say that because it is a shock to a lot of people because I think it's something like 60% of the population still doesn't believe that climate change is a thing. And it absolutely is a thing. Oh my God, we can see it. Oh, oh, oh. We can see it happening year after year after year after year. And yes, the earth does have natural fluctuations. Yes, our CO2 levels rise and drop. Yes nowhere near the levels that we're at right now. So normal fluctuations would be like fluctuating, 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 fluctuating. We're here. We're here. Okay, that's not a normal fluctuation. That's physically impossible for the planet to do without our help. I mean, with the whole, um, with the whole coronavirus right, ha right now, have you seen pictures of like the Italy canals, the, the Himalayan mountains from India that you can finally see for the first time in like 60 years? Um, the smog is just gone. Like here in LA, we have some of the best air in the world right now. And you're like, what? No, we don't. We're a coastal city with winds because we're right next to a desert. We should constantly have good air, but it took billions of people staying at home for a month or two for actually our environment to kind of to get better. And really, it doesn't take that long. A couple weeks of this and the, the oceans were cleaner, the canals were cleaner, the air is cleaner, the birds are back, the fish are back. Like, it only took a couple weeks without humans and the planet is healing itself because the planet is very, very resilient. But we got to stop messing with it. Like, we do, we have to stop messing with it. We have to stop our CO2 emissions and all of that. And that's why things like the Paris agreements are so important. Because they basically, it's an agreement from every country in the entire world that says, all right, all of our scientists agree that our CO2 is really a problem. We need to decrease our CO2 emissions. That's all we're going to do. Decrease our CO2 emissions in any way we possibly can. And every single country in the world was like, yeah, yeah, we have to do that. Otherwise, we're all going to die. The whole planet, we're going to destroy everything. Yes, we have to do that. And so every single country in the world signed it. Except us. We pulled out of it. Consider these things next time you guys vote. Like it's really, it is an it is a huge deal, especially with the election coming up. We have, you know, it's important to make sure that you have a candidate who actually believes in this stuff and that wants to do something about it because it's no joke. It's really no joke. We are causing the planet to change and potentially to change point, past the point of no return. And that's a scary thought. That's a really, really scary thought. So... So again, we kind of already talked about what can happen, why it's called climate change and not global warming. Yes, on average, the temperatures are going up, but all weather is getting more extreme. So in places like Antarctica, it's getting colder, like too cold. In the Arctic, it's getting way too warm. In the Antarctic, it's getting way too cold. Hurricanes are getting way stronger than they should. We have like at least a couple Cat 5 storms every year. We're supposed to have one every 50 years, but we're having one like every year. That's a bad thing. Our sea levels are starting to rise because the polar ice caps are melting. This is water world stuff, people. Like, literally, we're going to lose coastal towns. We're going to lose areas like the Keys that have, like, you know, that are three feet above sea level. Potentially, this could absolutely completely submerge that, and we could lose things like islands. I don't want to lose islands. I love islands. So, <laughs> it really is difficult to predict where this is going, how our planet is going to shift because of this. It will, of course, shift, and life will go on. Whether we're going to be here or not is hard to say. Um, but life is resilient, and life will find a way. It's just kind of hard to predict what kind of life and what we're going to have left and what we're going to lose is just really just terrible. So, so again, here's, a, here's some average temperatures. So you can see basically from 1860 to the year 2000, yes, we have natural fluctuations, right? But right around the 1900s when we had things like industry and manufacturing and plants and stuff like that, which are putting out pollutions, now you can see here that we're starting to rise and rise and rise. Now, we did have a little dip right here, and that's when people started to realize, hey, um, we're kind of screwing things up. Can we, like, make things a little cleaner and a little nicer? Because, like, things are getting really bad really quickly. So then we started to regulate. And guess what? Now we're just too many people in the world. And now, again, the temperatures have started to rise again and rise again. Because where there's too many people in the world, there's too much industry, there's too much pollution, there's too many things that are affecting our climate. Um, and like I said, in irreparable ways, if we don't actually start to do something. Things like recycling, things like reducing CO2 emissions, things like reducing our carbon footprint. And these are little things that we can do every single day. You know, the whole reusable grocery bag. That's a huge source of plastic that we've removed. Now, they are still plastic, and most people still just use them once and throw them away not what we're supposed to do. Um, 
but we're getting better. You know, decreasing straws. That's like a tip of the iceberg, but decreasing straws is kind of, it's, it's helpful. Um, really, and I think we already mentioned this in class, but the number one source of plastic pollution on the planet is single-use um, drink drinking containers, like your single-use Starbucks mug or a single-use water bottle. All of those single-use plastic containers, like that is the worst source of plastic on our planet. Um, anyway, I digress. <sighs> I know. This is just, it's, I, there's just so many different ways that we're messing this up and so many things that we can do to fix it. And we're going to talk about that. So it's not all depressing. So let's keep going. Um, we have seen in, like I said, an overall increase in the temperature over the last hundred years. Um, this is a 33 degree Fahrenheit on average. I think it's only like one and a half degrees Celsius, something like that. And you're like, oh, that's not that much. It is. A lot of these organisms live within a very narrow range, very narrow temperature range. If you're shifting that, you're going to lose a bunch of those species. I mean, we're losing the polar ice caps right now, which means we're going to lose our polar bears. There's a very good chance that in your lifetime, we will lose polar bears. And that's devastating. <sighs> okay. Um, so yeah, we have all sorts of these things we've, we've kind of talked about um, that are really just going to affect everything. So... You know, we have things like increased sea levels. We have uh, shifting migrations in species, right? If the waters are getting warmer, if you're a cold water species, you're going to try to find colder water. So now the distribution of species can actually change. The corals are going to bleach. We're going to lose all of our coral reefs, which are hugely diverse and abundant in all of these different species. We potentially could lose all those species just because we lost the corals. Um, yeah, so again, ugh, it's all sorts of bad. Uh, temperatures that are too warm. Algae don't like, certain algaes don't like temperatures that are too warm. If we start getting all these warm waters, we're going to lose all of our algae. Remember that we get the bulk of our oxygen on the planet from the ocean. So now if we warm our oceans, potentially we're going to lose all that primary productivity. We're going to lose all of that oxygen and the base of the food chain. So that's like a double whammy right there. Just, it's, it's, it's sad. It's literally, it's just all kinds of sad. So what do we do? Can we do anything? Yes. Yes, we can. We absolutely can. And we have. We've, we've definitely gotten better. Um, you know, we're not... We have things like... Well, we're going to talk about them. Let's talk about them. All right. So we got to conserve what we have. Right? Whatever we have left, we have to conserve. So this is where things like Endangered Species Acts are so important. Right? If we only have a few left, let's conserve them. Let's make sure that we can do anything we can to keep them. Um, things like catch limits and stuff like that. Things like temporary closures, right? Temporary closures are wonderful. Stop fishing for six months. Go fish something else for six months. Come back in six months. For this six months, let this organism and this species replenish itself, right? Then you'll be able to fish it more, right? So seasonal closures are a big one. Catch limits are a big one. Um, oh, getting rid of gill nets. So these super huge nets that we just throw in the ocean that just catches whatever, Get rid of them, okay? We don't need this much. Um, you know, sell less. Unfortunately, that means selling it for more, so it becomes more expensive. But that's probably just how it has to be. Otherwise, we're going to lose it all. You know, it's... Uh... Um, so, there have been bans. There have been bans on some of these things that internationally we are working on together because we know these are the things that we have to get rid of. Those gillnet bans are one of them. That's one of the things in the 80s that they were like, we got to get rid of this. It's got too much bycatch. It's really just too effective. Like, we just we need to stop. But not all countries, you know, have agreed to this. So some countries are still using these gill nets. Um, and they trap everything. The bycatch, the number of bycatch in these, these it's horrific. Horrific. We're going to learn about something. We're going to learn about the shrimping industry and the number of bycatch there. Um, the bluefin. So bluefin tuna is one of the most prized fish in the entire world. However because it's so delicious, it's a great fish, it comes in these big steaks um, because the fish is so big, but these are slow growing, you know, longer lived organisms. It takes a long time for bluefin to reach its full size and therefore we're just catching them way, way too quick. So then we said, okay, all right, let's at least limit the number of bluefin that we can take. We'll limit the size of bluefin that we can take. We'll try to kind of regulate this bluefin fishery so that we will still have bluefin in the world. We won't overfish every single bluefin so that we have none. Right? They go to extinct. So we're trying to protect that. We're trying to fix that. Uh, whales, too. There are a lot of countries that are no longer allowed to catch whales. Some of those countries are rolling back those regulations, but there's still a lot of them out there that say, no, you're not allowed to catch whales anymore because we, we understand now that whales are mammals. 
they have complex relationships, they're intelligent, they have family units, um, and they're endangered. Almost every species of whale is kind of hurting out there. So they're like, all right, let's just stop, we'll stop or at least regulate the whales. Now there are still com some countries that are allowed to whale, um, especially up north, there's some Nordic countries like that, that it's part of their culture. And they will take one whale, and that one whale, they'll use every single part of it, and it will feed the entire village. They're not whaling to get things like perfumes or makeup products. I'm not joking. A lot of makeup products have things like whale blubber in them. So we're trying to get away from stuff like that. Other alternatives, so we don't actually have to kill whales anymore. We can actually just, you know, make these products on our own without killing anything. That would be ideal. That would be perfect. So we're working on that. We are working on these things and we are there are many countries that have banded together and they're like All right, we're gonna make this an international effort and we're all gonna say nope We're not doing it anymore. We're not gonna do it anymore and we're gonna be better So like I said, we are getting better. We are trying there are people out there who are making a difference So if this is something that interests you mar Marine conservation is a huge topic right now. Like please get into it. It's a big deal and it's very very important Um so we are working on pollution as well. So we're no longer dumping into the ocean most of the time. Um, so we're trying to remove things like point uh, pollutions, like where it's a single point of pollution. Um, a lot of the plastic in the ocean is actually coming from just a handful of rivers, a handful of rivers. So we're trying to stop it there so that it doesn't get to, you know, to the ocean and to become a really big problem. Because once it's in the ocean, it's really hard to remove. So we're trying to actually get these points where, you know, we're polluting and trying to stop these individual points so that we can, you know, pollute, pollute less overall. Um, we're trying to protect coastal wetlands. So a lot of uh, places are doing what's called wetlands restoration. So they were wetlands. We destroyed them. Now we're trying to replenish them. We're trying to repair them. So that's restoration or restoration ecology. We're trying to get it back to what it was. And we're doing an okay job of that. You know, we are... You know, some places that are like, you know what, we've never built here, we're never going to build here. This is a sanctuary now, and that's what we need. We need more of those. So we're getting better with that, which is good. Things like marine protected areas too, same kind of thing. You're not allowed to take anything from here. So we're leaving those areas kind of protected, at least trying to. Invasive species, no more dumping in the ballast water, no more introducing, like I said, those country lines, those state lines even sometimes are like, just don't do it, don't bring it, don't have it. We can't have these things crossing state lines or country lines because of the potential ecological impacts that they could have. Fishing, when it comes to fishing, we have things like size limits, right? Sometimes they're like, you can't take it if it's too small. Sometimes they're like, you can't take it if it's too big, right? So you can only take the medium sized fishes. That's a pretty good way to go. Right? Some of them are like, no, anything over this size you can take. Um, oops. Oh, never mind. Um, what else? The gillnet ban. Again, that was a big one. But just because of the sheer numbers that it was taking and the sheer number of bycatch. So you're going out there trying to fish fish. And you're catching dolphins and turtles and sharks and anything else that just happened to swim by this net. Because they can't really see the net. They can't sometimes detect the net. And they just swim right into it and then their gills get stuck. And that's the whole point of a gill net. It's efficient, but it's terrible. Because they just, they're just floating out there for weeks sometimes. So anything for weeks that swims by, they just catch and kill and then it's horrible. It's horrible. Certain species, we're just saying, hey, you can't take them anymore. Just can't take them anymore. Remember the fish that I work on, the, the baby giant sea bass, right? The really big fish we have off our coast. You're not allowed to catch that anymore, period. It was overfished in the 1900s, almost to the point of extinction. And it's a big, beautiful apex predator. And so we're like, look, done. Shut down. Can't do it anymore. We're not taking it. And their populations have started to return. That's awesome. So we're getting better when it comes to the fishing thing. So good job. We are getting better. Like I said, some fisheries are worse than others. The bluefin, again, is kind of one that's being overdone right now. But we are kind of getting regulations in it. Um, shrimp. Shrimp is a big one, and I hate to say it, I love shrimp. I eat shrimp too. I try to limit the amount of shrimp that I have because of the bycatch. The sheer amount of bycatch that is in the shrimping industry is ridiculous. It's, it's what is it, uh, nine pounds? Nine pounds. Nine pounds of bycatch for one pound of shrimp. So one pound of shrimp, nine pounds of other things have to die for your one pound of shrimp. That is super wasteful. That is just hugely wasteful. So this is one of those fishing um, industries that are just super unregulated and very uh, um, improperly managed and, and done. And it's just, it's killing so many things. 
So unfortunately, I do hate to say, guys, limit limit your shrimp. You gotta eat shrimp every once in a while. I totally understand. Limit your shrimp because it's horrific the amount of damage that the shrimping industry does. Um, so like this is an example of all the shrimp that have been caught. Um, and this is an example of all the things that are just being dumped back overboard dead. Dead and will never be used and just never be able to reproduce because we took some shrimp. So there are alternatives to shrimp. Um, a couple of them are the pink shrimper, pink shrimp fishery in Oregon and the spot pond, spot, spot prawn, say all these fast, fishery in uh, British Columbia. These guys do it in a sustainable way. They do it where there's no bycatch or at least a minimal bycatch. So you're not getting all of these dead animals just to get a little bit of shrimp. You're actually just getting these and not all the bycatch. So there are sustainable shrimp shrimperies out there, um, but you do have to do some research on it and because most people don't know. They really just don't know that the shrimping industry is just so bad for the environment. And again, like I said, I love shrimp, but I do try to limit the amount of shrimp that I eat. Same thing with my bluefin tuna. I love bluefin tuna, but I try to eat very little of it and only on kind of like special occasions just because... We're just taking too much. We're just taking too much. And I would like eventually there, you know, to still be bluefin and shrimp in the future. All right. So some success uh, stories that we have. I can't speak today. It's our last lecture. My brain is fried. Um, the Goliath grouper, right? So a really, really big grouper lives in Florida, down in Mexico, um, heavily overfished. Again, people love to get those big, big fishes. Also fishermen, you get more bang for your buck when you ping, bring in one large fish instead of 20 small fish. Um, so they have luckily placed, uh, regulations on that and it is, it is starting to come back. And so that's amazing. Uh, the giant sea bass, which we already talked about, that's my fish. We've seen numbers come back in amazing ways. Um, you can actually find them again. I mean, for like 50 years, you'd be lucky to ever find one, even see one. Now you can go out and see a few, you know, on a regular basis. And, and this is again, a great sign that the populations are coming back. Um, the striped bass and the white sea bass, again, both larger fish that have just been taken too much. It's just too popular for fish, uh, fish to catch. Um, so their populations have really taken a heavy hit. But due to regulations and things like the White Sea Bass Restoration Project that SeaWorld actually does here off of Catalina, where they grow baby giant, uh, baby white sea bass, excuse me, and then they release them out into the wild to help restock those populations. So again, people give SeaWorld like, you know, kind of guff for the fact that they did the whale, you know, the killer whale program, which was unfortunate. But yes, in the 70s, they stopped taking them from the wild because they realized that it was wrong and they just started breeding them in captivity. Um, but they do a lot of really good things like the White Sea Bass Restoration Project. So you do always have to take com some of those companies, at least the rumors about them, with a grain of salt and do some research on your own. Um, they're not necessarily always bad companies just because they did one bad thing. Now, I will say, like, the blackfish thing was very unfortunate. We already talked about that. Um, but it's, you know, it's still, they were still doing good. They were still spreading awareness about those orcas because they had them in captivity. Um, I know I fell in love with marine animals because I went to SeaWorld as a kid a lot. And I fell in love with those orcas. And I, you know, if you'd never seen an orca in real life, you probably wouldn't care to save them. So that's what those aquariums and zoos and stuff do. They, they allow you to see those animals that you would never see and would probably never see in your real life um, to make you care about them, to help with conservation about them. So I know it's a hot topic controversy. Do we keep animals in zoos or not? Um, I personally think it's not that bad. It's, you're talking about a handful of animals that are usually very well fed, have be better medical and dental insurance than I do, um, and, you know, have a not so terrible life. You know, certain species, yeah, probably shouldn't be kept in captivity, but those are probably the species that we need to conserve. So, again, it's a catch-22. You can go either way with it. It's, it's, it is a, and it's a touchy subject, so you can have whatever opinion you want on it. Um, neither one of them is going to be completely correct. So, they both have positives and they both have negatives. Anyway, moving on. So, good things. These are all examples of programs that we have done, fishing regulations that we have done that have allowed these species to come back and their populations to replenish themselves. So, we are getting better at this, like I said, and policy and regulations are the way to go. That is what is going to make these things come back. Um, and we've seen it in the past. We'll see it in the future if allowed to actually regulate. So, these are good things. These are good things. Uh, more success stories. The gray whales, right? We stopped whaling. Japan stopped whaling. Um, so they, you know, these whales have started to come back, which is really, really great. 
California sea lions, same kind of thing. With the Marine Mammal Protection Act, a lot of these mammal species were actually able to come back because you're no longer allowed to touch them, kill them, harass them, even come near them um, to protect them. Same thing with the elephant seals, the harbor seals. These are all really great success stories because we're not taking them for fur anymore. Um, we're not taking them for their skin anymore. We're not taking them for meat anymore, right? We're just allowing them to be and allowing their populations to come back. Um, the green sea turtle in Hawaii, their populations are coming back. We're not killing them anymore for things like their shell and turtle soup and silly things like that. So now when you go to Hawaii, you can actually see these turtles on a regular basis again. And I did, and it was amazing. I mean, that's why I got this, literally, in Kauai. Because I went swimming with the turtles. Because they were still there, right? So it's great that, that some of these um, organisms are coming back. Um, and it's just as long as we leave them alone. The ocean is very resilient. Our planet is very resilient. It will bounce back. But when left alone, when left alone. Ah, marine protected areas. We already did a lab on this. Um, so you guys should be familiar with this, with Sylvia Earle and everything she's tried to do in Mission Blue. Um, but they're marine protected areas. And so they're like, you cannot take from here. You cannot fish from here. You can't even technically pick up a rock and remove the rock or a shell. Like, it's just protected. And that's what we need. These small areas that are normally very, very productive, right? So that these productive areas are allowed to hopefully replenish the other areas around them. So if you protect this little pocket, the populations everywhere around, you know, because they'll eventually disperse out, hopefully those populations will come back as well. So this one area is going to be productive for the whole uh, area around it. Um, and that's the goal. That's really the goal, is to allow these areas to be untouched, to allow them to replenish, hopefully. Um, let's see. Now, these, these are very successful, but usually they're in areas that have a lot of fish. And so, of course, they're going to piss off the fishermen because they want to be in these productive areas. So we look for the most productive areas, and the fishermen are like, well, then this is our productive area. How are we supposed to fish? So usually we pick areas that are targeted heavily by fishermen to allow, because the fishermen know where the fish are. So we need to protect where the fish are. There's no point in protecting areas that aren't productive, obviously. But then, of course, you have that argument with the fish. Well, I can't feed my family, but your you know, grandkids aren't going to be able to feed themselves kind of battle that you go back and forth. So really an ideal MPA would be one of these productive areas that gives you healthy spillover. So they're reproducing inside here and eventually they're going to move their way out. So unfortunately what these fishermen do is they kind of target the MPAs and what they, they look go really close to the outside areas and you're like really dude like you're and then sometimes oh I drifted into the MPA I didn't know poaching stuff bad, bad humans. All right, so, but again, it's, it's how big is enough of an MPA? So we're now starting to develop more and more MPAs as time goes on, but what is enough? Is 10% enough, 20%, 30%, 50%? Um, you know, because again, you have this argument between the fishermen and the scientists, like what's better? You know, are we going to be allowed to fish or should we not be allowed to fish so the, or the populations can replenish themselves? So, um, you know, these fishing industries do suffer when a new MPA comes up but it should only be temporarily. It should literally just be temporary because once that MPA is established, they're going to reproduce, the populations are going to increase, and then they're going to be able to spread out into other areas. So then those fishermen can uh, fish those other areas. So yeah, temporary, temporarily it does kind of affect them. Sometimes, you know, it's kind of severely if it was like a really big hot spot. Um, but again, this is long term. This isn't what can you, how are you going to feed yourself today? It's how are you going to feed yourself for the rest of your life? How are your kids going to feed yourself, themselves for the rest of your life? Like, it's, it's, it's long-term, and that's something that we really have to start looking at more is this long-term stuff. Not so much, oh, my God, what am I going to do today? What are we going to do 100 years from now? And that's what we need to, bigger picture stuff is really what these MPAs are all about. So they're getting better. We are getting better. And they're really, oh, my God, if you've ever been swimming in an MPA, it's like night and day. As soon as you leave the MPA, you're like, where did everybody go? But you go into the MPA and you're like, this is beautiful. So um, Catalina has a lot of really nice MPAs if you ever want to go check out those. So I would highly recommend those. So unfortunately, MPAs really work awesome. They're great. But as you can see right here, about 2.8% of our entire oceans are MPAs, which means the other 97% are not. So this graph basically shows everything that is unprotected everything that is unprotected in red and what is protected in green. So no matter how productive those areas are, it's still most of our oceans are not protected. 
And that can be kind of a problem. Because again, what, how many species are you protecting in that one MPA? What about a species that isn't found in that one MPA that's over here? You need to protect that too. So that's why we're looking to increase the amount of MPAs that we have and the sizes of these MPAs. But sometimes we're getting fought. So it's kind of a... Anyway. Um, so we do need more marine reserves. We need more of these no-take areas. We need more of these kind of like... There's even no boating areas. Like if there are seagrass beds and stuff that's are like, no boating here. These are for manatees and for juvenile species. And that's kind of what we need. We do need to protect. The ocean's really big. Right? So we need to protect more of it, for sure. So these MPAs are working. We know they're working. We just need more of them, and they need to be larger. Um, so here are all of the really amazing points for MPAs, and here are some weak points against MPAs. So again, it's, it's, there's way more evidence for MPAs than against MPAs. But you're getting fought by things like policymakers, by things like politicians, because they're like, well, then we can't fish there. We can't drill there. We can't, you know, ruin it for whatever we need to ruin it for. So they're getting fought, but really they are the best things. Um, it really is super crucial that we have more of these. Um, you know, and you can, you, can make, you can make money off of them. There's nothing wrong with making money off an MPA if that's what you're worried about. You know, money. Um, you can make them into ecotourism areas, you know, this protected area, you can do snorkeling trips and boating trips and stuff like that. Again, kind of causes pollution, but ecotourism is popular and, and will actually help. Um, so that's another good source of income for there. Great for conservation, um, great for management of species, just really, really great for so many things. And, you know... Yeah, you have, it's going to inconvenience you. It's going to require closures. Oh, okay, it's not like by fishermen. Um, you know, uh, it's, yeah, it's not necessarily effective for he heavily mobile species, like species that are going to travel far distances, but those aren't really good reasons not to have MPAs. Yeah, okay, it's not perfect, but what else do we have right now? Shut down the whole ocean? Well, technically we shut down the whole world right now and it's working pretty well. Yeah, let's shut down the ocean, <laughs> but that's not going to happen. So what we can do is just create small areas that are like, mm, just don't go here, right? Don't fish here. Don't pollute here kind of thing. So way more evidence for than against. So MPAs, very good things. So wrapping up this whole depressing, not so depressing, slightly uplifting, hopefully in the future um, lecture. There's a lot that we're doing wrong. A lot. Pretty much everything. But there's also some things that we're doing right. So we are getting better. Like I said, we are getting better. And that's really where we need to go with this. So regulations, um, MPAs, spreading awareness. Most people do not know about bycatch. They don't know where their food is coming from and they don't care. So spreading knowledge and spreading awareness is like step one, right? Making people actually care about this is kind of the biggest thing that we need to do right now. Um, so any little choices that you guys can do, um, also we're going to make a huge difference. Avoiding shrimp when possible. Avoiding bluefin. I know they're delicious. Eat them once in a blue moon and you'll be okay. Um, but making sustainable choices. Like when we did the, um, I don't know if we did this lab or not. Um, the fish take home fish lab, right? When you looked at the fish market fish and it's like, okay, is this a sustainable fish, right? Is it wild caught? Is it farm raised? There's benefits to both. Um, benefits and negative things to both. So really looking into where you're getting your food, uh, reducing your CO2 emissions, your carbon footprints, um, recycling, um, not wasting plastic, not using plastics, reusing reusable cups and stuff like that. Little tiny things, guys, make a huge difference. If everybody in the world did a little bit, like we're doing right now, it makes a huge difference. It really, really does, but we all have to do our part. So hopefully you guys will because... I love the ocean. I love everything in the ocean. Even the creepy, crawly, slimy, crazy with the jaws and the ah! With the, yeah, I love them all. And I really want to see them all survive and last. And, and in my own lifetime, in the 30 years that, you know, I've been around, I've seen, I've seen some of this stuff. I've seen coral reefs die. I've seen fish populations decrease. I've seen the size of fish decrease. Um, it's sad. It's sad. But we can and we will make it better. So hopefully you guys will go forth. And you'll take this with inspiration and you'll spread awareness about it and you'll do any little thing that you can and maybe even possibly become those policymakers and those, um, you know, conservationists who are out there fighting for our environment. And, and I really hope you do because it's something that's amazing and beautiful and we should cherish um, because we could live on 
you know, just a complete bare desert planet with nothing. And that would be horrible to me. So hopefully you guys love the ocean as much as I do. Hopefully you guys have had a wonderful time with this class and I tried not to make this last lecture too terribly depressing. If you have any questions, please let me know. Um, I, you know, I'm going to miss you guys all. Thank you so much for being in my class. I really appreciate it. You guys have done a really amazing job. Um, thanks for bearing with us with all this online lecture stuff, the craziness that's been happening. Hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your semester. Good luck with finals. Um, I will be around if you guys ever need to, you know, talk to me, see me, ask me questions. Come on field trips. Again, I don't care. Come join us. But otherwise, have a wonderful rest of your semester. And I miss you guys already. And um, take care.